the code team leader along with that recorder, they really do need to be, I think, the brains behind the operation as the code is progressing. They've got to work in unison to think through the scenario, identify areas for intervention. They really are steering the ship, especially for me as I'm still pretty early in my career. It's easy to want to jump in and get my hands on the patient. And while, yes, sometimes that's necessary, I really think that the best codes that I've seen have been the ones where the code leader is able to focus on leading, on orchestrating the action around them and not get into the fray. Welcome to Critical Care Time, the podcast for everyone who cares for the critically ill. I'm your co-host, Dr. Cyrus Askin. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Nick Mark. On today's episode, we're going to discuss a topic that many people who are new to critical care find very stressful, what to do in a cardiac arrest. That's right, Nick. I remember the first code I was a part of in medical school, and it was pretty terrifying and quite overwhelming. I'm hoping we can provide our listeners with some pitfalls and pearls that they can take to the bedside should they be asked to respond to a code. Absolutely. And just to be clear, we're not going to spend this episode reviewing BLS and ACLS. We assume that if you're listening to this, you've got some background. Instead, we're going to try to give you the 201 class, kind of walk through some of the more advanced aspects of a code. What are the important roles? What interventions are helpful? And what to do if you're the code leader? So without further ado, let's get into it. So maybe we should get this started by asking a really fundamental question. What is a code, Cyrus? So I think of a code as being uh, an, an instance where you have cardiac or respiratory arrest or or when either of those things are imminent. How do you uh, how do you look at codes, Nick? Yeah, I think that's a good definition. Um, I, I think of it kind of you know maybe from a slightly different lens as like stressful, high stakes um, event that requires a series of rapid coordinated actions by a team, right? And you know I, I like the definition of cardiac or respiratory arrest or when that's eminent because that includes other things like somebody who's having a seizure or somebody who's, you know, unresponsive. There's like sort of a smooth transition from a rapid response into a code. And nobody should ever feel bad about calling a code because it's not a code yet. You know, if you're worried, you should get the resources you need there. I think that's really important. I think uh, call uh, the, the whole reason why we call these codes or have rapid responses are to have the resources available to provide the best patient care we're able to provide at that point in time. And so I, I totally agree with you. When I was uh, early uh, early in my training, I, I, I felt kind of gun shy in those situations. But really, I've uh, as I've gotten a bit older and developed uh, a modicum of wisdom, I've realized that um, you know calling those codes can be really helpful. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, can be a instrumental in, in saving a patient. So, and just to, just to amplify that point, Cyrus, you know, there's evidence that having rapid response teams reduces hospital mortality. So not only does this make people feel more comfortable, but it's actually good for patients to have a team that you can call. So don't be gun shy, as you said about calling. Great point, Nick. So as we said in our intro, uh, we're going to approach this episode from the perspective of the code leader. We're not going to harp on ACLS and BLS, but rather we're going to try to provide a framework for leading a successful code. So, you know, Nick, obviously we're both physicians and we often end up being the ones who lead codes, but does it always need to be that way? No, it definitely doesn't. Um, so, I mean, you know, if, first of all, if you think about the broader world outside the hospital, right, all out of hospital codes in the United States are run usually by EMTs or paramedics. In the hospital in the U.S., there's there's a growing movement to have nurse-led codes. There's actually some good evidence in support of that, which we can talk about in a second. That's awesome. Yeah, I I, uh, I, I think there is actually some data, like you were alluding to, that uh, suggests that maybe codes can be more effective even when uh, a nurse runs them. I mean, so specifically, there, there's been at least one simulation study where they found that in simulated codes, having an RN team leader would, provided cognitive offloading for the physician. And that had to that led to some pretty significant improvements like improved time to defibrillator application, better quality CPR, and shorter time to address reversible causes. Specifically, that last one, shorter time to re- address re- reversible causes, basically means that the, the physician was getting to the thinking part of a code about 100 seconds sooner. And that's, that's pretty meaningful, I think. The key thing is, is that whatever the title and training of the person leading the code, one of the key aspects of the code leader is to avoid task saturation and keep eyes on the big picture. There's lots of analogies you can use for this. You know, you could think of the code leader as the quarterback, the orchestra conductor, the coxswain if you if you row crew. I think of it as this person's job is to bring some semblance of order to chaos, to make sure that the absolutely mission critical events are carried out 
promptly and correctly. I couldn't agree more, Nick. I, I think that's really well said. So, you know, we've set the stage now for our discussion. Why don't we roll into a case? Um, we'll say you're covering the ICU and you hear a code called overhead. You look down at your pager and you see it's a code blue on the medicine ward and it's a 68 year old male uh, who was admitted with an acute exacerbation of COPD and they were on on by level. And, and now you're on your way to see this patient. W- what are your initial thoughts? All right. So I have my jacket with my stuff in my pockets. Let's go. One thing to think about as we're going to a code outside of the ED or the ICU is that often these are more challenging. It's a patient who's unknown to me. There's going to be less and more unfamiliar equipment to work with. Um, Depending on what ward we're going to, the staff may have never been involved in a code or seldom be involved in a code. And these are important challenges to to acknowledge as you're running to the code, right? You're you're going to bring some members of your team with you, but you're going to rely on the people and equipment there to bring you up to speed about this patient. Getting stuff is going to take a little longer. So just good good to know the challenge of where you're going. Excellent. Excellent points, Nick. So so we'll say that, you know, you've run down the hall and now you've arrived at the patient's room. You see the non-invasive mask on the ground and you look at the bed to see a pale looking man who's unresponsive laying there. You've got one person who's attempting to ventilate with a bag valve mask. The other one is performing CPR. And so, Nick, as you're walking in, as you're trying to develop uh, an understanding of the room and what's going on, what are your priorities? How do you prioritize those responsibilities the moment you walk through that door? So I think about it as the first five to 10 seconds, the first one minute, and then the first two minutes as kind of three sort of time blocks we need to think about. The first five to 10 seconds, you can take a few seconds and look around the room. And I guarantee you there's all kinds of clues in the room that will tell you a lot about what's going on. So first of all, you know, you can just look and you can see like what equipment is in the room. You see a BiPAP machine already. That's a diagnostic clue. If you see a dialysis machine, that's a big clue. You know, other than medical equipment, there's other stuff, right? What drips are hanging, you know, what infusions are running or were running. Um, And then there's all the other sort of non-medical stuff there, right? You see, you know, Christmas lights and teddy bears and pictures on the wall, you know, this person has been there for a long time, as opposed to if it, you know, if it looks like, if it looks like the room you're in, my friend, you know, it looks a little bit, it looks a little (laughs) bit less, less lived in, right? Um, You know, and that's an important clue too. And then finally, you know, who are the people in the room, right? Is there a family member present? Who are the rescuers? Do they look like they're comfortable doing what they're doing? Or do they look like, you know, I haven't touched this silly bag valve, whatever in years. And so you're just five seconds, scan the room, kind of try to take in what you see. That's really important. There's one other thing you need to look for in that first five to 10 seconds. Who is running the code? If there's somebody who's clearly conspicuously running the code, great. If you don't see that person, you are the run, the one running the code. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, so moving on to the next minute. In the in the first minute, I like to sort of use this A B C D E mnemonic. So A airway. Turn to the person at the head of the bed. What airway do we have? Are you, B bagging. Are you able to ventilate? Okay. C compressions. Is this person doing good CPR? Is there a CPR board underneath or is the bed in CPR mode? Remember, doing CPR without a CPR board or with a soft bed is basically worthless. So that's something you need to fix right away if it's a problem. D, defib, are the pads on? If they are, hey, what was the initial rhythm? And then finally, E, epinephrine. No matter what algorithm you're in, epinephrine is in it. Um, so you can call for it right away. There's no, there's no reason to wait for more information. I think that's a really powerful, um, kind of tool that our, our listeners can use is that ABCDE algorithm. And, and hopefully they'll be able to take that away from this, uh, from this episode. So thanks for sharing that, Nick. Um, We'll, we'll continue then uh, here with our case, um, and we'll say that during that, that initial survey, you see what appears to be appropriate single rescuer BVM technique, uh, as well as good quality compressions, and it looks like the bed is in CPR mode, so we're, we're good there. Um, you look up at the monitor, you see what looks like ventricular fibrillation, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little difficult to tell because there's also the compressions going on, but, but it looks like V-fib. Um, you're not seeing any blood pressure reading. You're not seeing an oxygen saturation that's registering hard to tell if that's because, uh, the patient has arrested or if it's because the, you know, the sat monitors on the floor with everything else, but, but that's kind of what you're seeing. Um, 
And, and as you said, you look around, it doesn't really look like anyone's running the code. So you're the de facto code leader. Um, you position yourself at the foot of the bed. And now all of a sudden you got a flock of assistants ready to help looking for direction. Um, so, so what do you do next, Nick? How do you, uh, how do you manage this now that, uh, you're, you're, you know, 15 or 20 seconds into the code? So now it's, you know, now you're, now you're fully into that, you know, conductor of the orchestra role. Your job is to take these people and sort of give them order. So maybe you have one person at the head of the bed. Do they need somebody else to go help them? Hey, can you, can you help the person on airway, um, do two rescuer ventilation? Okay. Um, maybe get an OPA while you're at it. You know, that's a airway B bagging. Um, Hey, can you feel for, can you, can you see chest rise while they're doing that? You know, confirm that this ventilation is effective. C compressions. Um, somebody is doing good CPR. That's great. Um, however, doing CPR is tiring. It's hard to maintain good CPR for long. So I definitely want to know who's, who's next for CPR. So, you know, I'll just say who's, who's on deck for CPR. We're going to, we're going to change compressors, um, at the two minute mark at the end of this cycle. D defib. Okay. We've got the pads on. Is there someone running the defibrillator? Um, and then M meds, um, who's drawing up meds, who's giving them. I've already said, let's give Epi. So, you know, Hey, you know, pharmacist, can you do this? And by the way, you know, this is a great opportunity to use people's names, right? Eye contact, say their name. It's a really good, really powerful way to like, make sure that they hear you above the, you know, potential chaos of the situation. And then finally, you know, assuming we have somebody who, who can do procedures or do ultrasound, um, you know, ideally, ideally if we have multiple physicians, right? One physician should be managing the airway, one should be setting up to do procedures, POCUS, and one should be running the code. Now, if you don't have three physicians at a code, and I almost never do, you have to collapse those roles somewhat. And so there's kind of variations on this. Sometimes I'll lead a code from the head of the bed if I have to manage the airway. But this is a great situation to hand off to an RN code leader because, you know, it's I'm not going to be a, a very effective code leader if I'm also intubating and, you know, coordinating other stuff. Similarly, I can be the code leader and I can get hands on and I can do stuff, but it's really good to hand off at that point if I need to be in that role. I guess for this, maybe we should just assume there's other people and I'll sort of stay in one role, but it's important to acknowledge that you should be very deliberate about those transitions. Hey, so-and-so, can you take over? I'm going to do X. I think that's a really um, important point to make is, is that element of closed loop communication, which is so, so important, particularly in these, um, you know, high risk, high reward situations and code situations where, um, you know, not only do you want to make sure that the person knows uh, what role you're assigning, um, but also you want to make sure that as interventions are being performed, you are getting that real time feedback from the person that's intervening. So I think making sure that that closed loop communication is a big part of any code that you run is is paramount to success. Um, and, and I think the other thing I want to mention here, which we didn't specifically mention, is the importance of the recorder in any sort of code situation. I think uh, in my experience, I often I, I find that they're sort of the unsung hero of the code, but that the best codes that I've been a part of have had experienced, usually ICU nurses that are recorders who are functionally like my second brain. You know, they are there, they're, they're keeping tabs on what's happening. They've got eyes on the patient. They're able to help me work through, you know, H's and T's that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, having a good recorder kind of as your right hand man or right hand woman is to me, like it is just absolutely essential if you want to run a successful code. Do you have an opinion on that, Nick? Completely agree. Um, you know, if I'm the conductor of the orchestra, the recorder is like the music and the metronome, right? Like we need, we need them to maintain the tempo and we need them to ma help maintain the structure in the organization. Excellent. Excellent. And, and Nick, I know, you know, you often talk about how there's a physical structure, but then there's also a temporal structure to a code. Can you elaborate on that element? Yeah. So the physical structure is important, right? I mean, you want to make sure that the bed is pulled out from the wall. So there's room at the head of the bed. You want to make sure that there's room on both sides of the bed. So you can have compressors on one side and you can have people who are administering meds or doing other procedures on the other. You want to make sure there's a little bit of room at the foot of the bed. So you're not you know, squeezed up against the wall. Um, that's the physical structure. And that is important, but the temporal structure is really important too. And the temporal structure is actually pretty straightforward. It's basically 
two minutes of CPR, very quickly assess, two minutes of CPR. And that's all you're doing until there's a reason to break from that structure. I think one thing that can be really challenging is to make that break as short as absolutely possible. And there's a couple of tricks we should talk about there. What tricks might those be, Nick? What do you, uh, what do you like to, uh, to do to sort of ensure that those pauses are not running too long? So, you know, on one hand, we want to keep the interruption in CPR as short as possible because we know that um, the, the more prolonged CPR is, the better the intrathoracic pressure is, the better per, the perfusion is. So that's important. But we also know that your average person is not able to do effective CPR for very long. Like I remember when I was in EMT, sometimes we do CPR for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes without changing rescuers. And you'd be just like absolutely soaked in sweat. And you were not doing good CPR or as good CPR by the end of that as you were at the beginning. Um, the European Resuscitation Council actually recommends changing rescuers every two minutes. Uh, I think there's good evidence for that. Um, I saw recently on, on Twitter, uh, sorry, X, that there was a um, CPET study where they looked at people doing simulated CPR, and they found that most people hit their anaerobic threshold after a few minutes. Um, so I think there's good reason to think that most people will not be able to do good CPR for long. So we should sh make that as short as possible without adding interruptions, which means change every two minutes if you can. What that means is to coordinate it, remember you're the conductor of the orchestra, you have one person on deck and you, you say to everyone very clearly, okay, we're approaching the two minute mark. When we do that, we're going to pause CPR for a few seconds and I want you to step off and you to step in and start CPR. That way it's like one person's hands off, the other person's hands on, they start. So it's only a few seconds. It's only the time you need for the switch. And during that time, you can be looking at the monitor, you know, the plath, the art line, somebody else can be feeling for a pulse. Um, you can be looking at the rhythm. So you can get all the data you need in just a few seconds and keep an interruption as short as possible. That's great, Nick. I think those are some really awesome pearls for our listeners. So we'll go ahead and, and we'll continue now with our case. We'll say that, you know, you finished that initial survey. We've already talked about some of the things you saw. You've started to assign those roles and you notice that pads hadn't been placed yet on the patient. So you make that change. You, you, you have your, your um, defibrillator operator get pads on them. And because of what you're seeing on the monitor, um, you prepare to charge the defibrillator, get it charged, and you deliver a shock as soon as you can um, once the team members are safely clear of the patient. Shock is delivered. You look up and you see sinus rhythm. So you're, you're feeling good. But unfortunately, you ask for a pulse check and there's no pulse. So Nick, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do with this patient? A couple of points now. First of all, let's back up just a few seconds. And I just want to clarify one thing, which is that when you are getting ready to do that, that pulse check, you should be charging the defibrillator then. So we're like 20, 30, 30 seconds out from our pulse check. Okay, turn to the defibrillator person. I want you to charge and be ready. Don't give a shock until I tell you to. Now, when we get into that five second break in compressions. If we see VF on the monitor, all I have to do is, you know, tap them on the shoulder and say, give the shock. And then we'll give the shock and then we'll resume CPR. That way we avoid this sort of stuttering tempo, which is like CPR, what's the rhythm? Oh, it's VF. Okay, charge. Wait, resume CPR. Okay, now we're ready. Stop CPR. You know, you can you can simplify all of that by being ready to deliver a shock the second you assess. So that's one point. In this case, so bringing us back to the present, we had a, a very common situation happen, which is that somebody went from VTVF, which is a common initial rhythm, to PEA, or pulses of electrical activity. Um, and so this is a situation where we want to get back on the chest, we want to resume CPR, and now we're sort of moving into the next phase of our code. So if minutes you know, one and two are sort of about establishing a structure a temporal structure, a physical structure, getting people into roles. The next couple of minutes are where we have to do more definitive procedures and where we have to start thinking about what the cause was and acting to reverse it. Perfect. So once you've sort of made that transition into that role, um, as the code leader, uh, how are you, um, how do I want to say this? How are you working through what could be happening with this patient um, to have caused that change in rhythm? So, so first, first off, I, I think we need to think about kind of you know what you know 
my, my job at this point has shifted from just getting everybody sort of doing what they're going to do and sort of now we have to build sort of a shared mental model of what is going on with this patient. Um, and this is kind of an ask, tell, ask situation, right? So I don't know this patient's history at this point. I've been in the room for like two minutes. Now is a time to hear the story from the people who know this person. If there's somebody who's free who can go on the uh, go on a computer and, and get more information, that's great. But this is a great time to, you know, take the – you know, if the primary team is there, the primary nurse is there to, to hear about this patient, because that will that will cue you to think about things that might have caused this. It's also very valuable to think out loud. So if somebody says something, you're like, oh, they're on this medication, you should acknowledge that. You can say, oh, they're on a calcium channel blocker. We should think about that. That's a good way for everyone in the room to know what you're thinking. It's also really useful, speaking of thinking out loud, for you to sort of like kind of conduct the things that are happening. So to say, okay, we're on cycle two of CPR, our initial rhythm was VF, and then we converted to PEA after one shock. We've given epi, we're not going to give that for a few more minutes. Right now, we're trying to figure out why this happened. And I think that sort of that sort of thinking out loud framework makes everybody understand what's happening, and it makes people sort of like primed to think of suggestions. What about this? What about that? Which is really what you need. You can't you can't carry this whole burden yourself. It's going to take a village. Make all the villagers feel like they can contribute to the plan. I think that's a really great strategy is to um to utilize all of the folks that are um that are there to be part of that shared mental model to sort of help you work through that patient presentation. Again, it's like being able to distribute some of that responsibility to other folks while you're working through your own train of thought, uh, I think can allow us to generate the most robust problem representation, if you will, during a, a what would be a stressful situation. And I know a lot of folks will use the sort of H's and T's model in a situation like this to help them not miss diagnoses that can be intervened upon. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit, Nick? I do, but I think, I think we have to acknowledge one thing, which is that in order to think about the H's and T's, we're going to need some data, Right. How are we going to know if they're hypoxic if we don't have, you know, some blood? How are we going to know if they're hyperkalemic without some blood? So, so while we're starting to think about the cause, we also need to be gathering data. And some of that means talking to the primary team, people who know this patient. Some of it means looking at the patient. Uh, but we also need to think about, like, we need, we need vascular access so we can get blood. We need um, point-of-care ultrasound so we can cross a few of those things off the list. And then once we've gathered some more information, then we can sort of run through our H's and T's and quickly exclude the ones that don't seem likely. Speaking of which, so let me let me ask you a question, Cyrus. So what are, what are your thoughts on uh, vascular access during a code? Yeah, so I think there are definitely different ways to approach that issue. And your approach is going to be dictated by a lot of different things. So I've had codes recently where a patient has literally just come from essentially the street, if you will, to the trauma bay with nothing. They've got no access. They've got nothing at all. Uh, versus the the more common situation that we're maybe comfortable with is, you know, patients in the hospital, they've got a couple IVs or EMS has brought them and they have some, some IV access. And so you know, to me, those are two vastly different situations. In in the first example where the person has nothing, I certainly think it's reasonable to try and get peripheral IVs. But in someone who's been down for a while, who may be volume deplete, that may be, uh, you know, easier said than done. And so in, in patients like that, I'm pretty quick to put in an IO. Um, you know, people often are a little squeamish about that because you're drilling into the bone. But really... I mean, if, let's call a spade a spade and, and this patient's dead, you know, we're, we're trying to resuscitate them. And so I think hesitancy when it comes to IOs is probably not warranted, um, especially because they're a very effective means of resuscitating, of giving medications, et cetera. So I'm a big fan of IOs. Um, I think peripheral IVs are, like I said, they're great. To quote Sarah Palin, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Drill, baby, drill. Get that IO in there. Um, yeah. So I, I think those are great. I think if you have peripheral IVs, that's awesome. If you can get one, that's awesome. Um, you know, there are some uh, issues with certain labs that you get off of an IO versus a peripheral IV. So you can't always trust the validity of um, some labs, although electrolytes are typically pretty good when you draw them off an IO. So that's something you can feel uh, reasonably confident about. Um, but but anyway, uh, so 
uh, aside from IO and peripheral IV, uh, certainly if someone has a port or an HD line, I mean, typically we try to steer clear of those for routine use, but this is a situation that's far from routine. And so I think they're, they're very reasonable, um, points of access to utilize. Um, and then finally, there's, you know, there's the central line. And, and is that something that we should prioritize in a patient um, who is uh, in the midst of a code? Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it can be uh, sort of like an exciting or heroic thing, quote unquote, uh, to do during a code. But I often ask myself, is this the best use of our time when you can get an IO in a patient within, you know, a matter of seconds, uh, whereas putting a central line can be quite challenging, um, depending on the anatomy and, and, um, you know, some other factors. Um, if I am going to place a central line, I will usually use a femoral site, uh, getting to the neck when you're managing airway and a code is just, can be really difficult. Um, whereas I think you have a little bit more room, uh, to work in the, in the, uh, the groin. And the, the other nice thing is that you can, go ahead and kind of just, um, grab the ultrasound, take a look, um, and, uh, you know, get a good look at both the femoral artery and the femoral vein. Or if you don't have that resource, you can feel the pulsation during CPR and go for that, that point of maximal pulsation, assuming that's going to be the artery. If it is the artery, great. If it's not, and you're in the vein, well, you can kind of adjust fire and, and do what I, what, uh, one of my attendings called the kind of quote unquote dirty double, where you just do a double fem stick and whatever you get first is what you get first. And then you either move left or you move right. And then, you know, and then you have your second line. So you have an arterial line and a central line pretty quickly. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, I don't know, Nick, do you have a different approach to this or a different, uh, different philosophy? No, I, I, I very much agree. I, I think, you know, stepwise approach, IO is fast, robust access. You can get it in most people, especially if you're doing humoral. Um, peripheral IVs are good too, if you can get them. And, you know, no holds barred when it comes to accessing ports or HD lines. If somebody has access, use it. Um, if you are unable to get access like that, or if you need better access, for example, the person needs, you know, significant resuscitation, um, agree with placing codes, uh, pl placing lines during a code, though I agree with you, it's often not the best use of our time. And it's often not the thing which is going to make the biggest difference. Um, if you are going to do it, uh, the art line along with the central venous line is, is almost like a, a must do in my opinion. You know, the art line improves the quality of your resuscitation so much because you're immediately aware of whether this person has a pulse or not. You're immediately able to draw blood for, for quick labs. Like it just gives you a lot. Um, so I mean, often like I'll, I'll do the art line without the central line if we have sufficient access already. Great point, Nick. That's a great point. What about um, some of the more advanced procedures, thoracostomies, pericardiocentesis? What's the role for those? You know, I think I think the role the role is real, but but seldom, and that's why we often think of them as um, high acuity, low occurrence, or halo procedures. Um, this is a situation where the person is is literally dying from something, whether that's a pneumothorax or tamponade or, or some other pathology. Um, so there's a couple of parts to this. Number one is you have to, to recognize and diagnose this. So getting probe on, this is usually sub xiphoid approach to look at the heart during compressions, don't stop CPR, um, and see if there's a big effusion. This is a diagnosis that should be easy to make if it's truly the cause of arrest. You might need a few seconds during the pulse check to really be sure, but this is something you can figure out quickly. Similarly, probe on lateral chest and anterior chest, you should be able to very quickly determine if there is bilateral lung sliding or not. Um, and those can trigger you to say, okay, does this person need, does this person need a finger, a finger thoracostomy for pneumothorax? Does this person need a pericardiocentesis for tamponade? The next question is, you know, is this something that you're going to do? Or is this something where, you know, depending on your, your experience and training, maybe you need to get somebody else. The sooner you recognize that this is the problem, the better, because you have to get equipment, you have to get ready, and maybe you have to get somebody else in the room if that's not a procedure that you do. So recommend um, prioritizing point of care ultrasound early in the resuscitation so you can figure out those things that might take five minutes to make happen. Nick, what I really like about that approach is it allows you to identify what resources you need fast, whether it be tools or people. Um, because I think that 
that can represent a real delay in care. Um, and so using POCUS to help inform those decisions is, uh, again, one of those things that's really going to help out a patient. Um, the other thing that I, um, I like to use POCUS for sometimes is when we're, when we're tr sort of trying to differentiate between PEA and pseudo PEA. And this is somewhat of a controversial topic that I, I thought we could discuss a, a, a little bit. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you walk us through that? What, for, for, first of all, what is pseudo PEA? Yeah. So pseudo PEA is a low flow state where an organized rhythm is generating inadequate and often undetectable blood flow. So you could think of pseudo PEA as being this very severe shock state versus true PEA, which is electrical activity that does not generate a pulse. And is this a, is this a distinction without a difference or, or why, why does this matter? Yeah, so I, I think it does matter. And and before I get into this, what I'll say is, by and large, I, I wouldn't recommend that our listeners spend a lot of time hemming and hawing over whether this is PEA or pseudo-PEA. Um, I think if you aren't familiar with what pseudo-PEA looks like, you don't feel comfortable, then I wouldn't recommend deviating from the ACLS algorithm um, in most cases. However, if you do feel comfortable making that distinction, it, it does matter because um, if you if you feel confident in saying this is pseudo PEA, then what you're really saying is that flogging this person with epinephrine and CPR might actually cause harm. It may not be exactly what they need. Um, so um, one thing to know is that this is a difficult distinction to make, and that arterial line, Nick, that you had mentioned can be really helpful in addition to having entitled CO2. That arterial line can show you whether a pulse is being generated that you just can't palpate. And if you see that, that can be um, a tip-off that maybe this is actually pseudo-PEA. And just like that arterial line can be helpful, so can POCUS, which you discussed earlier, um, using point of care ultrasound can tell you if maybe there is tamponade or dynamic hyperinflation, um, or tension pneumothorax that's causing not PEA, but pseudo PEA. And so, you know, does that change your management? No, you're still going to manage those issues as you would otherwise, but it may, um, it may alter the meds you choose. And like I said, it may actually cause you to, to pause CPR. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So, so really fundamentally, um, what you're, what you're doing in these situations is you are considering those H's and T's that we're going to discuss, but identifying pseudo PEA might actually, um, alter things that you do right, um, right there at the bedside. And specifically, uh, this was actually looked at in a, in a small study, a very small study in 2010 by Prosen et al., who looked at 16 patients in whom echocardiography was used in conjunction with entitled CO2 to identify pseudo PEA. And so they, they saw evidence of this in these, you know, 16 patients, again, super small number. And, uh, what was done was CPR was actually ceased for 15 seconds, which is like an eternity in a usual resuscitation, um, and vasopressin was administered. Now recall that vasopressin has historically been part of ACLS algorithms, but since has sort of fallen out of favor in regards to, to routine use. Um, and so in these folks, vasopressin was administered and 15 out of 16 patients had ROSC with vasopressin and with CPR being held. Um, and so Yes. Is this the most robust study in all of critical care? It obviously is not. It would be great if we had a bigger study, if we had you know more data to, to, um, to draw from. But the physiology makes sense. And this does kind of, at least in my mind, give us a little bit of, of ammunition to deviate from ACLS, um, the ACLS algorithm, if the findings at bedside suggest that you're dealing with pseudo-PEA. So, so really to summarize, um, it's a condition where there, there is a kind of subtle pulse being generated. It's more of a overwhelming shock state than true dissociation between electrical activity and mechanical activity. And if you see that, it may be an opportunity for you to change your approach a little bit, as I described. Um, and, and that may actually be the the ticket to getting that patient back. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I, I think that, you know, I think of this as the extreme of shock. This is somebody where if you get that art line in and then when you pause compressions, you see there is a pulse, but the blood pressure is like 30 over 15 or something. That's not an 
adequate blood pressure, but it doesn't mean we need to do more CPR. Potentially what we can do is we can give them something to raise their afterload. We don't necessarily need to give them a ton of epi, which is going to be very arrhythmogenic. It's going to make that heart probably pretty unhappy. You know, this is a situation where you can try to to raise their blood pressure other ways. And obviously if that's not working, you're going to just go back to CPR. But it's it's kind of one of these edge cases where ACLS kind of gives you a foundation and this is sort of building on top of that. Well said, Nick. So, you know, we've talked now about pseudo PEA in the context of point of care ultrasound. Uh, I think we've once again proven the worth of point of care ultrasound in yet another situation. Aside from that, what other data do we often have that's readily available that we can draw upon to help guide us as we make decisions during a code? So I think first and foremost, if you have the ability to do point of care labs, so like in my hospitals, we use iStat, which I think is great. You know, that gives you an ABG, VBG, chemistry panel, a uh, quick uh, hemoglobin hematocrit. Like that's absolutely valuable information and that can inform a lot of your next steps. Do you need to activate a rapid transfusion protocol because this person's bleeding? Do you need to treat severe electrolyte derangements? Is this person severely acidemic? Is this person severely hypoxic? There's just tons of information there. So getting that chemistry running quick is really important. The other thing that goes with the blood though is make sure you're getting a glucose too, right? Sometimes people forget to do that as well. And that's another quick 60 second or 30 second point of care test that will tell you immediately if there's something you need to reverse. So blood is one. If you're at a hospital where you don't have the ability to, to do point of care um, lab work like that. This is like the situation where somebody should run it to the lab and run back with the ABG results. It's not ideal. It will take longer, but it's still better than waiting, you know, the, the usual time. The next piece of information that we often get and often should get is end tidal CO2. So end tidal CO2 is this great physiologic measure of CO2 delivery to the lungs right? So you could think about CO2 as being proportionate to how much CO2 is getting to your lungs. That tells you how well is the heart pumping and how good is the CPR. It can also clue you into other pathologies, like if this person's um, end tidal drops suddenly, that, that, can, that can be a clue of either a heart problem or a blood flow to the lung problem. Our goal end tidal during CPR is above 20. Um, we know from a couple observational studies that if your end tidal is less than 10 for greater than five minutes, that's a poor prognostic sign. That means that you are not generating enough, uh, enough flow with your CPR to deliver CO2 to the lungs, which means you're also not generating enough flow with CPR to perfuse the brain and other organs. Um, the last metric that we should really talk about as a resuscitation endpoint is another data point is blood pressure. And this is a situation where we actually, the, the number that we care about is diastolic blood pressure, right? So the reason for that is that, remember, your, your left ventricle in particular is only perfused during diastole. And so the, if the blood pressure in diastole is too low, your LV is essentially not getting perfused. And that means the likelihood of converting to a perfusing rhythm is very low. Um, so we want our diastolic blood pressure to be greater than 30. This is a great reason to put an art line in. This is a situation where, you know, it's something about, it, you can think about a lot of things that go into this. One is vascular tone and use of meds like um, uh, vasopressors. The other, the other is like, does this person need some more epinephrine to push that dose higher? Uh, and it also, it could be could reflect volume status. So remember that when your volume status is low, your diastolic falls. So when you see somebody who's having a very low diastolic blood pressure with CPR, you should, it should go through your mind that maybe this person is hypovolemic for some reason. So those are all excellent tools, I think, that we have at our disposal and should take advantage of. So now that we've talked about all that and we spent some time talking, point of, talking about point-of-care ultrasound – um, I, I think it might be reasonable to get into some of those H's and T's. So, so Nick, do you want to walk us through some of those H's and T's and how we can uh, work through those at the bedside? Absolutely. And I think this is a situation where you should work through them out loud. Share with the, share with the room what you're thinking so everybody knows that it's going to avoid duplicative efforts and that people are going to jump in with useful suggestions. So let's do it right now. First H, hypoglycemia. Well, we checked a glucose. If it's low, we're going to give D50. If it's normal, we're going to move on. Next H, hyper and hypokalemia. So we got some blood. Hopefully we ran it on an iStat machine or some other point of care lab. So we know the answer quickly. Um, if it's high, 
we could consider calcium, insulin, dextrose, the whole, the whole treatment protocol. If it's low, and I really mean if it's extremely low, like if it's less than one, that's a situation where you actually might give potassium during the cessation. Next up, acidosis. So if, if their pH is really low, um, like less than 6.9, you should think about giving some bicarb. Next to age, hypoxemia. Um, you know, if the person, let's just, just assume for the point of this, that the person has had a definitive airway placed, either a superglottic, uh, airway or they've been intubated and we're ventilating them. Okay. Um, if our, if our oxygen levels are still really low, um, we could think about what else does this person need? Maybe they need more PEEP, for example. So if they're being bag valve ventilated, make sure the PEEP valve is on, make sure it's turned up. Uh, another H hypothermia. Um, this is often a problem as the code develops. Um, we expose people, we're giving them cold fluids. Um, if you have the ability to get a good core temperature, that can be useful. Um, sometimes it's not, but it's, it's always worth considering. Um, and then the final H, hypovolemia. So this is something where we might have seen clues in our blood pressure. We might see clues on our lab work if the hemoglobin is low. And we might see clues on point of care ultrasound. For example, if we see a hemothorax or blood in the abdomen or some other conspicuous place where the blood is going. Uh, this should be a this should be a trigger for you to say, okay, I want you know, a massive transfusion protocol. I want it right now. You know, somebody go go to the blood bank, come back with a cooler. You know, in the meantime, you can give some you can give some um, crystalloid, uh, which you have readily available. But remember, your goal here is to think fast so that you can start these interventions early. That will take a little bit of time to pay off. And so, an MTP will take a few minutes, but that's what the person needs if their hemoglobin is three. Moving on to the T's now. So these are these are more things that you can fix with your with your hands. So first off, tension pneumothorax. This is something you'd see on on point of care ultrasound. This is a situation where you could do a needle decompression, a chest tube, or thoracostomy, kind of depending on what your what your skill and preference is. Um, we we actually have an upcoming episode on pneumothorax, so I'll defer the details to then. Next up, tamponade. Um, if you see tamponade, you know you should be thinking about where is the kit and who is the person who can do it. Um, next T, thrombosis. So this is both MI and PE. Um, if you if you see you know evidence of a blown out RV, you see a clot in transit, you see something which is a clear indication. Um, this is another situation where thinking early gives you the 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 you know the the, the necessary runway to do the intervention because what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to say to your pharmacist we're going to need thrombolytics we're going to need TPA right now um, have somebody run to the pharmacy mix it up and get it and usually it will take at least a few minutes to get it to the bedside but the sooner you recognize the need for it the the more likely it is to work um, the final two T's. Uh, toxins. So this could be a medication that the person was taking, you know, at home. This could be a medication that they're they're on in the hospital. Um, often, if somebody is on opioids in the hospital, I will I will give them a test dose of naloxone. That's usually not the reason for the code, but it's worth trying. Um, occasionally, you'll see somebody who's on another med that can cause this. So, for example, somebody's on a lot of calcium channel blockers, you could give them calcium. Somebody's on um, tricyclic antidepressants, you could give them bicarb. Um, you know, there are, there are, there are countless other antidotes we could talk about, but I think, you know, sort of looking through the med list and thinking about what fits with the story is the key cognitive step, um, to get those antidotes moving. Um, the final one is T is trauma, which is a little bit kind of duplicative with the others, right? It's a little bit like tension pneumo. It's a little bit like blood loss, but you know, it's a situation where looking, looking at their chest and abdomen with ultrasound, looking at their hemoglobin can clue you in on the need potentially for transfusions and procedures. Perfect. That's a, that's a nice comprehensive walkthrough of those H's and T's, which hopefully our audience will be able to reference in the future. Uh, should they, uh, should they have a need for, for that, that great tool? Um, so we'll go ahead, I think now and get back to our case. We'll say that at this point we've expanded our workup and unfortunately we haven't really found a specific intervention that is needed. Uh, we don't have a reason to suspect pseudo PEA and unfortunately none of the POC labs have really given us much that's, that's actionable other than a metabolic acidosis. So we see the metabolic acidosis, we give the patient two amps of bicarbonate, uh, CPR continues along with intermittent doses of epinephrine. And here we are 20 minutes later and nothing's really changed. So, Nick, unfortunately, things are looking a little bleak. Um, 
What what are you uh what are you starting to think now? I mean, is this a situation where we want to have family present uh, during the resuscitation? Is this a situation where we need to be revisiting you know what it is we're doing and and how likely it is that we're going to be successful? How do you how do you start putting this together? Yeah, so I think family presence during resuscitation is a really important topic, and it's something that we probably don't do enough in practice. And I think we got to th- kind of acknowledge two sides of this coin. So on one hand, CPR is traumatic. It's traumatic if you don't know the person to hear ribs breaking and to see it. Um, And you can imagine that watching a loved one die like this is very, very traumatic. But on the other hand, that loved one is dying, right? They're not dying because of the CPR. They're dying in spite of it. And it can be very helpful for the family members to see that everything was done to try to save their loved one. Um, So I think the key is to find a balance. You want to give families some context and you want to give them the option to witness resuscitation. Um, And then for the people who choose to do so, you want to do it in a slightly controlled manner. There is some good evidence for this, by the way. So there was an RCT where they um, randomized um, family members of patients who were undergoing cardiac arrest to either be present or not. And they found that when offered in the intervention group, about 75% of family members chose to be present. The family members who chose to to witness CPR had lower rates of CPR. They also had fewer symptoms of anxiety and depression. There's also been a meta-analysis on this topic of three RCTs, which found that having family present did not affect the mortality or survival rates, and the duration of resuscitation was unaffected. So I think we have pretty clear evidence that inviting family um, to be present, most of them will say yes, and that is actually more likely to have, um, well, it's going to be a less traumatic outcome for the loved one, and it's not going to worsen the care we deliver to the person who is in cardiac arrest. So I think those are compelling reasons to do it. The devil's in the details, though. Absolutely. And so how do you do this practically, Nick? How do you, uh, how do you actually make this happen? So there's kind of two, two sort of pathways to consider. One is, what if family's there when this event occurred? Assuming they are, I'm going to have somebody kind of gently escort them out of the room, sit them down in a chair, and calmly explain to them what's going on. Your loved one is sick. We're we're doing everything we can to resuscitate them. Um, You know, this kind of gives us those first few minutes of the code without family present to sort of establish establish order, do all the things we need to do. Um, It gives the family a little bit of time to process and and potentially calm down if they need to. Um, And then after we've sort of reached this later stage of the code, then this person who's kind of assigned to the family can give them the opportunity to return. Now, obviously, they want to make sure that the team in the room knows this is happening. So we can do things like if we've done a groin line, let's, let's cover them up. Let's give them some modesty. You know, um, let's let's try to let's try to make it as respectful as possible when we bring the family back in. Um, you know, the the person who's with the family should tell them, you know, what to expect. You're going to see people doing chest compressions like you've seen on TV. The person, you know, is going to look like this. Um, the other situation is where the family wasn't there when it happened. And so sometimes they're like in a waiting room or something. And that's a little bit easier because then you can task somebody to go out and get them to sort of brief them, prepare them, give them the invitation to be present. And then if they want to be present and once the team is ready to bring them in in the same manner. Cyrus, what's what's your approach? How do you do this? You know, I, I think I follow a very similar approach to you, Nick. I, I think it's uh, in my experience, family often does want to be at the bedside to kind of feel that sense of support for their loved one as they're going through this uh, through this experience. Uh, and and I think it's it's unfair of us to not give family the opportunity to be there, um, both because it it gives them that um, that feeling of being part of this experience, as traumatic as it may be, but also it. Um, I think it gives them an opportunity to see what's being done for their loved one and to, in that moment, think through what makes the most sense in the context of, um, you know, of their family member, of their friend or what have you, as far as continuing efforts to resuscitate or terminating efforts. Um, It's sort of like allowing them to make an informed decision. Now, I certainly don't, you know, twist any arms for, for some very understandable reasons. Some folks just don't want to be part of that because it can be so traumatic. But usually what I'll do is I'll try to identify perhaps one of the more experienced team members who's who's been in codes before to talk to the family and determine 
what they're most comfortable with because, you know, you, unfortunately you can't really step away. I, I've certainly done that before where I've talked to families, but I, I always feel like my role during codes is to be at the bedside with the patient. And so more often than not, I'm identifying someone else to, to have that important discussion so that I can focus on the patient in front of me. And just to add to that, I think if it's a code that takes place off of the usual unit, there may be somebody who has a rapport pre-existing with the family. You know, there may be a doctor or a nurse who's been taking care of this patient for a while who's the best person to have that conversation. If it's a patient that you know very well, sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe your time is valuable doing that. Um, but but I, but I agree, you know, it, it's a dedicated job. It's not something that somebody is just doing for a minute. It's like, once you've bought that role, it's like airway, you're going to stay with that role. While we're, while we're on the subject of the end of resuscitation, we should probably talk about detecting return of spontaneous circulation. So Cyrus, how do you, how do you go about that? So return of spontaneous circulation or, or ROSC is the goal, right? Obviously we want to bring our patient back. And what that means is that they're able to generate a blood pressure. Their heart is pumping once again, um, and they're able to perfuse at the end of the day, it's all about DO2, right? So, um, you know, there are different ways to do this. Uh, we've talked about end tidal CO2 and an end tidal CO2 that's greater than 20 and sort of rises 20, 25 or so, uh, is, is a really positive sign. Um, especially, um, you know, if, if the trajectory is, uh, is persistent, um, and you're able to, um, to combine that with changes on the monitor. So if you all of a sudden see, um, a, um, uh, an, an ECG tracing that's consistent with sinus tachycardia, let's say, or some sort of heart block, whereas before you had ventricular fibrillation and you're seeing the end tidal CO2 rise, then that person probably has ROSC. Um, and, and that's, that's of course, again, what we're, what we're shooting for. Um, other things that we want to keep an eye out for would be changes to the arterial line waveform, um, which, which can be tricky, of course, if someone's getting good CPR and they have an A-line in, um, you're often going to see um, those, uh, you're often going to see the fruits of their labor uh, on the A-line. But if you're, if you're doing a pulse check and you see um, the A-line is uh, reflecting a blood pressure and you feel a faint pulsation, that's great. Um, so again, palpable pulse, A-line. Um, also you can look at the, uh, at the pleth, um, that the patient would be generating from their, uh, from their pulse oximeter. Um, so that can be helpful. Um, and so, so really all of those things are, are helpful in unison, uh, to make the determination of ROSC versus no ROSC. And then once you've, um, achieved ROSC, then that's sort of when we're going to transition, right? So, um, once you have ROSC, it's a good time to start to dismiss some of those team members so you can reestablish order. A lot of times codes, despite our best efforts, can get chaotic. And so it can help to declutter the room of tools, of equipment, of medications that you don't need, and of people. Um, so, so that's part of that safe transition to post-arrest care, if you will. Um, oftentimes these folks are going to need vasopressors. So working with pharmacy to ensure that vasopressor drips are, are ready and going, um, working with your bed manager to get that patient from the ward to the intensive care unit or to radiology. I mean, all of those things are very important steps that happen on the heels of ROSC. Yeah. Um, I think there's a great Napoleon quote that sums this up really well, which is the, the greatest danger occurs at the moment of victory. So it's very easy after resuscitating somebody successfully to sort of drop the ball at this step. This is kind of the step where everybody gets a little too comfortable. People start to wander out. People are, you know, feeling good about this and these details can get missed. It's your job as the team leader to really stay laser focused on the situation and make sure that all of these, you know, absolutely crucial events happen in an orderly way. And you might need to, you might do that with fewer people. That's fine. But, you know, just remember that just because the code is over doesn't mean the person is out of danger. That's a great point, Nick. Cyrus, what, what should we say um, about targeted temperature management? Oh, man, the uh, the Pandora's box that is TTM. You know, my my dad always used to say that if you don't have anything good to say, just don't say anything at all. And uh, unfortunately, I, I think that the data regarding TTM is just so unclear um, and there's a lot of contradictory um 
information out there. A lot of people have strong opinions, whether they're founded or not founded. I, I just think the jury is still very much out. So, so maybe we'll cross our fingers, cross our toes, and hope that when we do tackle TTM, um, you know, maybe in a few months or so, the, the evidence will be clearer. But, but really, who can say, Nick? I, I don't know. That's that's my answer anyway. Agree. Let's let's circle back on this point. Maybe we'll have some more trial results, results and more clarity in the, in the near future. Um, okay. Final thing we should talk about, we've been doing this for 20, 30 minutes now, is we should talk about termination of efforts. So Cyrus, what do you use as evidence of futility? Yeah. So uh, great question. Um, I think there are a few things we can use in these circumstances. Um, one thing I consider is, is duration right away. So if you're 20, 30, 40 minutes into a code and nothing has changed um, and you've gone through your H's and T's and you've given boatloads of epinephrine, um, the, the longer you're in the throes of battle uh, in that sense, the, the less likely you're going to have a good outcome. Um, and some of the other harbingers of badness can be a, a, an end tidal CO2 that's persistently low, uh, labs that reveal severe acidosis, severe hyperkalemia, um, and then TTE, or if you have access to TEE, um, uh, either of those modalities that will show a complete lack of cardiac motion. Um, so that, that can be, uh, the, the, all, all evidence that might, um, might cause you to, uh, to terminate efforts. Um, some specifics. So if you have an end tidal CO2, that's less than 10 for greater than 20 minutes, that's certainly worrisome. Um, you know, like I said, uh, time. So once you get over 30 minutes or so, um, without any, um, any, any progress, um, that's probably a, a good number to remember. Um, and then that acidosis and hyperkalemia, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a pH of less than 6.8 or a, a potassium of greater than 10. If, if you're seeing those numbers, those are very poor prognostic indicators, um, and, and probably need to, um, to be taken very seriously as you're determining what you're going to do next with that patient. I agree with, I agree with all of those as metrics. I think this is a situation where it's really the clinical gestalt. So no one number, no one metric is going to tell you, you know, I've seen good outcomes after 30 minutes of CPR, especially when the person has some, um, attenuating factor, like they're cold or it's like a stuttering arrest, or maybe they code for a few minutes, you get Ross, they code again. And so maybe the, the whole resuscitation has lasted a long time, but their actual downtime is relatively short. Um, you know, I think when you see, when you see that like your, your acid, your acidosis is so bad, your pH is off scale low, your potassium is off scale high. Those are usually signs that this is not going well. Um, and then finally, like if you, if you look at the heart and there's just absolutely no motion in the setting of that low end title, that's persistently low, a long code and, um, labs that are incompatible. Um, that's, that's a really strong sign that, that this is now futile. Um, I think another thing to think about too with futility is also the family. If the family is present, often they will signal when they feel like futility has occurred. So futility is not purely a, in my medical judgment, this, it's also like the family is, is signaling to me that maybe, maybe they want us to stop too. And so, you know, remember clinical gestalt there are some there are some hard data points but remember it also reflects the context of the patient and the context of the family great point nick it, getting back to our case you know sometimes of course you do everything right you you run your h's and t's you you um do the procedures that are warranted and and unfortunately things may not work out so in this case um Despite our best efforts, we were unable to successfully get ROSC. Um, however, we were able to discuss the situation in real time with the patient's family who ultimately asked us to terminate our resuscitation efforts. And so while we always hope to get our patients back, sometimes we don't, um, you know, as I, as I said. And, and so I don't know about you, Nick, but I don't necessarily consider that a failure. I think that as long as we can look back on the code and honestly feel that all the appropriate interventions were done, I don't think we need to beat ourselves up over an undesirable outcome. Uh, what, what do you think? How do you work through that? So codes are exhausting physically and emotionally. And, and it's, it's really sad when a patient dies, especially when it's sudden or unexpected. So it's good to do everything we can to sort of give them dignity and give their family dignity. So it's good to clean them up, remove tubes and lines if you can. Remember, there may be some medical legal issues here. So, so not always. Um, and then give the family some time, right? Make yourself available for questions. 
think it's also really important to remember that this is a traumatic event, not just for the family, but also for the medical team, especially if either it's a it's a unit that's not accustomed to seeing codes, like they're in a rehab unit or something, no, no one no one's coded there in years, um, or it's like a patient who's really well known. You know, everyone is cared for them, everyone knows the family, and so I think it's really really valuable to after the resuscitation is ended, immediately after as the sort of family moves in and the team moves out to have a moment of silence to honor the patient right then. It really strikes me, Nick, you know, in the army, when we lose a patient, we'll often do an honor walk uh, for patients as they're removed from the ward. And, and I've always found that to be a very poignant and powerful way to honor patients that we've cared for and that we've laid it all out for. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's done in, in others, in civilian hospitals. I, I haven't seen it done myself when I've worked in civilian um, environments, but, but I think it's a really, it's a really cool tradition that we do. And I, I find it's a practice that can be really helpful for the care team. Um, and even it can help the family as they begin the grieving process. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great practice. I I've seen it. it it's a practice done at the VA, um, though, though not at other hospitals. And, and you're right. I mean, I think it's, it's good to sort of acknowledge the personhood of the, of the person who has just died. Um, I think during that moment of silence, we always, you know, it, it's kind of a good way to ground us and to think about, you know, the patient as a person, to think about their family. Um, I think almost inevitably during that moment, we, we tend to run through counterfactuals in our mind. You know, what if we'd done that? If only we'd done this, I wish I'd known this thing earlier. Um, and you know, because we all tend to be thinking those thoughts, I think it's very valuable to have a team debrief immediately after the moment of silence. Right. If you wait too long, people are going to be busy. I have to get back to my patient. I have to document. I have to do this and that. Do it right then. So have a moment of silence. Everybody, circle up. We're gonna we're gonna do a quick team debrief. Um, often, if there's somebody that I can send, I'll say go go get us like a couple pitchers of water because people are often you know sweating, dehydrated. Have some sips of water. We'll have a moment of silence, and then. Then we can take this time and kind of have a somewhat structured conversation. It doesn't have to be long, just a couple of minutes. I usually start with, let's talk about what went well and what we can do better next time. Um, I always try to talk about the quality of CPR because that's something that we're really good at assessing and improving on right away. Um, it's something that's relevant in every code. And then finally, I, I always try to call out, you know, people who did a good job, especially if we're in a situation like this where it's like an unfamiliar team, unfamiliar unit. Um, you know, you did you did great compressions, you were so fast at getting this. You know, I think people people are gonna feel really bad if you don't, you know, make the effort to complement the things that went well. Um I also think it's really important to remember this is an especially emotional moment for the primary RN and the team. So be sure to give them lots of time to talk and just listen. You know, let them go on and on if they need to. Often they're the people who need to vent. Those are all such great, great pearls, I think, for anyone that's going to be running a code is that uh, having a good idea as to what the debrief should look like and, and how important that is for the team to assess what was done, to get some closure, uh, and to prepare for the next code. So uh, thanks for sharing sharing those pearls, Nick. And and I think you know now that our case is concluded, I think it might be a good idea to summarize um, at, at least some of the elements of the code leader role for our listeners. That's really what we wanted to focus on: is what it means to be a good code leader. And so perhaps to to try to do that, Nick, do you organize the roles of the code leader in a particular way? Yeah. So I think the the first and foremost job of the code leader is to keep everybody kind of oriented, rowing in the same direction, rowing at the same time. That's, that's that sort of initial structure that is our job. And the calmer and more collected you can be with your voice when you do that, the calmer everybody else in the room will be. Um, the second job of the code leader is to form a shared mental model with the team. And that means, you know, asking people for information, putting that information together, and thinking out loud. It also means sort of narrating the code, that structure of we're on cycle three of CPR, we've done this, we've done that, we're going to do this. I'm worried about, you know, a hemorrhage, so I'm going to activate an MTP. Um, and then the final job of the code leader is to kind of make some of these tougher decisions, right? Is this somebody who needs an invasive procedure? You know, do they need a thoracotomy? Do they need a pericardial synthesis? Um, is this somebody we're going to crash onto ECMO? Do we need to get ECLS equipment here right now? 
Um, it's also important to sort of coordinate these transfers at the end. You know, where is this person going? Who else do I need in the room? And then finally, you know, the final sort of hard job, hard decision of the code leader is to make, you know, decisions like futility, communicate with the family and facilitate that debrief so everybody can walk away from this event with a sense of closure. Um, by the way, I don't mean to imply that we should only do debriefs when somebody dies. You should do a debrief with a successful code too, though often it's harder because people have to stay with the patient. But if you can, I think it's valuable to do it then too. I think I look at it in a very similar way. Um, you know, the the code team leader along with that recorder, they really do need to be, I think, the brains behind the operation as the code is progressing. They've got to work in unison to think through the scenario, identify areas for intervention, and then they, they really are steering the ship. Um, so I, I, I think especially for me, as I'm still pretty early in my career, it's easy to want to jump in and get my hands on the patient. And, and while yes, sometimes that's necessary, I, I really think that the best codes that I've seen have been the ones where the code leader is able to focus on leading, focus on orchestrating the action around them and, and not get into the fray. Yeah, well, well said, Cyrus, very well said. Um, I think that's a perfect a perfect moment to, to end our discussion. And this is the point in the show where I like to say thanks. First of all, thank you to all the people who have left us reviews, comments, given us a shout out on social media. Uh, we do read what you write and we appreciate your kind words, suggestions for future episodes, feedback. So thank you to all of you. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll also say, I think on behalf of both of us, Nick, thanks to the, the patients we've had the opportunity to care for during our careers that have helped us uh, you know, learn these lessons and appreciate um, what it means to be a code team leader and how sacred of a responsibility it is. So, so thank you. Um, thank you to, to all of them as well. We do really hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, and if so, please be sure to subscribe, give us a like, and please, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. This helps us tremendously expand our audience and means the world to us. Also, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, tweet or X or Y or Z or whatever it is today at Critical Care Time. Uh, or <laughs> you can tweet us directly. You can tweet uh, Nick at Nick Mark, uh, excuse me, at Nick M Mark, or me at Askins Razor, Askins underscore Razor. Um, and you can follow us on Instagram and threads, which is uh, our tag there is critical underscore care underscore time. And then you can check us out on YouTube as well via our YouTube channel. We'd also like to say a big thanks to our sponsor, uh, C Star Medical. We're very fortunate and grateful that this episode, as all episodes in season one, are sponsored by C Star Medical. C Star Medical is advancing the science of cell directed extracorporeal therapy to help restore the balance of a dysregulated immune system in acute kidney injury and sepsis. You should check out their website, cstarmedical.com, to learn more. Before we go, we'd also like to thank the incredible members of our podcast team for helping make this show possible. Um, we'd specifically like to thank our production team over at Podpaste, and last but certainly not least, Kurt Belknap for our awesome theme music. And lastly, a uh, couple disclaimers. Um, we should tell you, go, go to the website, first of all, www.criticalcaretime.com. Um, there's lots there. Um, the podcast and all the media you find there um, are the property of Critical Care Time. You're free to share it. It's, you know, it's, it's there so that you can share it. We just ask that you cite the source if you do. And in keeping with the disclaimers, uh, the views expressed within this podcast and any associated media do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. All references to patients or encounters have been modified to be HIPAA compliant, and thus any similarities to real world cases are purely coincidental. Finally, this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and should not be used in lieu of seeking medical advice. With that, thanks again for listening. I am Dr. Cyrus Askin. Yes, if you are listening to this podcast because you are coding, you have made a mistake. You should seek qualified medical attention. Um, on that note, I'm Dr. Nick Mark. So long, see you soon. Bye.